what we're going to be talking about today. Everybody. Okay. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is more um, amplifier analysis. Uh, so if I am not mistaken, when we, yeah, uh, no snow at all over here. Uh, so when we left off, I guess it was last Friday, I believe, we were looking at uh, common emitter amplifier configurations. And we found that for a general common emitter amplifier, where we have some power supply voltage VCC, some resistance RC, we take our output here, collector. Somebody needs to mute themselves because they're making lots of weird noises. So we had our output taken at the collector terminal. Um, our emitter, emitter terminal was grounded and our input was applied at our base terminal. And what we found was that this particular configuration, which I called the common emitter core, um, had an input resistance of R pi, um, a small signal output resistance of RC, and a voltage gain of negative GM RC. So we're going to revisit this circuit, uh, but now include the early effect. So all of these were no. So, with the early effect included, uh, our small signal model for our circuit is going to look something like this. So, here we have our base terminal. Our resistance R pi over which a voltage drop of VBE occurs. Down here is our emitter terminal. We have our transconductance GM being multiplied by our voltage VBE, producing our small signal collector current, but because the early effect is included, we also have this resistance R out in place. This is our collector. Um, since uh, our power supply looks like an AC ground, that means that our resistance RC will be placed between the collector terminal and ground. And since our emitter is at ground, I'm just going to draw it like this. And on the input side of things, we have our input signal over here between our base terminal. And ground. And our output voltage V out is the voltage taken at the collector terminal with respect. So the first thing that we're going to look for is our small signal input resistance, right? Rn. So as a reminder, 
the small signal input resistance Rn is the resistance that's seen by a voltage source at the input terminals, in this case, placed between the base and the emitter terminals, uh, divided by this current In that's leaving the positive polarity terminal of that test voltage. So it should be fairly straightforward here uh, to see that our input resistance, even with the early effect included, is still simply the small signal resistance R pi. Are we all okay with that? Yes. Okay. So to determine our output resistance, uh, I'm gonna make a quick copy of this. Let's see, edit, no, that's not how I do it. <laughs> Scroll down here. So when we're determining our output resistance, um, what we do is we short circuit our input terminals. So that means this quantity Vn is now just zero volts. And we apply a test source on the output side of things. So I'm just gonna call this guy the test and this current will be I test and the ratio of E test to I test is our output resistance. So with the input shorted, what is the value of VBE? It would be zero. Exactly right. So we have zero volts here which means this guy looks like zero amps. And so it should be fairly obvious to see then that our output resistance, R out, just looks like RC in parallel with our early resistance, R not, right? Uh, so effectively, I'm saying that none of that test current can branch off and flow through that dependent source. So all the test current is split between uh, the resistor RC and the resistor R0. Um, and then simple Ohm's law would get us this relationship that R out is equal to RC in parallel with R0. Anybody have any problems with that? All right, so finally, we need to determine our voltage gain. So for our voltage gain, we're literally just looking for um, the ratio of the input voltage to the output voltage. So, How do you think we're going to find the output voltage? Anybody have any thoughts? The uh, output voltage should still be measured from the point C to ground. Right. So I would argue. Um, will be the current flowing through RC multiplied by RC. So I would argue that we're going to have some current flowing through the resistor R0 and some cl current flowing through the resistor RC. And they combine together using Kirchhoff's current law to get this uh, current uh, dependent source current GMVBE. Does that make sense?
So if we consider this emitter node, our ground, if there is an output voltage, which we are assuming our output voltage here is non-zero, otherwise our gain is just zero, there's gonna be some current IR not flowing in this direction, some current IRC flowing in this direction, and they add together to make the quantity uh, GM VPE. And so from that, we could say that V out is negative GM VBE, the total current multiplied by RC in parallel with R naught, where again, the negative sign comes from the fact that the current is flowing into the negative polarity terminal. What is the relationship between Vn and Vbe? They're still equal. Still equal, yep. So Vn is equal to Vbe. And we can combine these results to find that our voltage gain is then negative GM RC in parallel with R naught. So let's talk about this result real quick. Is the voltage gain increased or decreased by the presence of the early resistance in general, or at least as compared to our um, previous case where the early resistance was neglected? It should decrease because the parallel will decrease the total equivalent resistance. Exactly right. So it's always going to be smaller than that idealized case. Um, because RC in parallel with R naught will always be smaller than just RC. Okay. Um, the quantity, let me do this here in blue. I'm going to call this AV naught is equal to negative GM times R naught is what's known as the intrinsic gain of the system. Um, so this intrinsic gain represents um, the maximum gain that this amplifier can have, um, which would correspond with a value of RC effectively being infinitely large. Now, we are not actually able to make the quantity RC infinitely large um, because we should have noticed from our previous um, homework sets and stuff like that and analysis that we've done that as the quantity RC um, gets larger, our voltage VCE um, trends in a way to push the amplifier uh, bias configuration into the saturation region for BJTs, which is bad. If it was pushing it further into the saturation region for Mo MOSFETs, that'd be fantastic. But we have that weird relationship to where um, saturation for a BJT is analogous to the triode region for a MOSFET. Okay, So there's effectively a constraint on the maximum allowable value of RC that we can use, which inherently limits the gain of our common emitter amplifier. So before we get into more of that kind of heady analysis talk, let's look at a couple of other configurations here, right? So our next scheme that we're gonna look at is the common emitter.
with what I'm going to call emitter degeneration. So emitter degeneration literally just means we put a resistor between the emitter terminal and ground. So that's going to give us an amplifier that looks like this. Here is RC. Still taking our output voltage over here at the collector terminal of our BJT. Still applying our input voltage be in here at our base terminal. But now we have this degeneration resistance here, RE, that ostensibly is going to influence the gain to some extent, all right? Uh, potentially the input resistance and the output resistance as well. So we're going to go through the steps of determining what the parameters are under this configuration. Uh, effectively, what we're doing here is we're working our way up to effectively fully biasing this common emitter circuit and seeing what the contributions of each of the resistors um, that we use in our full resistor bias network, or our full bias network, uh, have on the AC operation of the signal. Okay, so anyway. So our small signal model um, for this circuit is going to look something like this, where, again, I usually just start off by drawing the BJT model and then adding things to that so I don't make any silly mistakes. So here is our resistor R pi, our voltage VBE. This guy serves as our emitter terminal. Here we have our dependent current source GM B pi. And for simplicity's sake, we are gonna neglect the effect of channel length modulation here. Not channel, uh, early effect, sorry. So here's our collector terminal. Um, so between our emitter terminal and ground, we have that resistor RE. And then this node here at the bottom is going to serve as our reference for our circuit. On the right hand side, between the collector and our DC power supply, we're going to have the resistance RC. where our voltage drop is, or excuse me, our output voltage is effectively still the voltage drop over resistor RC. And on the left-hand side, we'll have our input signal. Yeah, like so. so. Is everybody okay with this small signal model? Anything not making sense. All right, nobody's piping up, so I'm going to assume we're all good to go here. Okay. So if we want to do our analysis here, uh, let's start with our input resistance. So again, I'm just going to draw. Uh, a current I in leaving the positive polarity terminal of our input voltage source. And it's not going to be uh, as simple as we had things earlier. Um, because effectively, there's now another resistor in the path that this current takes to ground. All right. So if we were to apply Kirchhoff's voltage law on the left-hand side of this circuit, 
what we would find is that our input voltage Vn, which in this case is acting as our test voltage, would be our current In that we're kind of trying to find here um, times our resistance R pi plus the voltage drop over our resistor Re, which has a combined current of I in and GM times, sorry, this should be VBE. Uh, GM times VBE, where we know that VBE is R pi times I N. Everybody okay with this KVL equation? Is it GM R pi? I N. Yeah. So, so let me let me explain that real quick. Okay. This. Oh, that. Okay, I get it. That's that's V. That's VBE. I get it. Exactly right. So that's just the the VBE. And, and so we can factor this a little bit, and find that we're going to have I N multiplied by. R pi plus R E times a factor of one plus beta. And so let me explain the simplifications that I've made here. Um, we know that R pi is Beta over GM, which implies that GM times R pi is exactly equal to beta. So everybody okay with my algebra to this point? Yes. Right. Is that um, GM R pi, is that from the lesson we had on Monday or last Friday? Yes, so GM is the small signal transconductance of our um, BJT that depends on the operating point of the circuit. So give me, give me just a minute and I'll rehash those relationships for you real quick. I'll go back in my notes. So GM is given as IC, our DC operating point collector current, divided by VT, our thermal voltage, R pi is beta over GM and we're not using it in this particular problem, but R not our small signal early resistance is given by the early voltage VA divided by our collector current IC. Okay, thank you. Yep, no problem. Yeah, so all those relationships we developed um, at length uh, on last Friday's lecture. So we've effectively isolated I in, so we can easily see now that our input resistance R in is just gonna be V in divided by I in or R pi plus one plus beta R E. So 
placing that emitter to generation resistor in the circuit greatly increases the input resistance, or at least the small signal input resistance of the circuit, uh, because typically speaking, our pi is going to be on the order of hundreds of ohms. Uh, well, one plus beta is usually going to be somewhere at least 50. And if our emitter resistor is even, you know, 20 ohms in uh, size, that means that the contribution of the uh, emitter to generation resistor outweighs uh, the contribution of the uh, small signal resistance to the BJT itself. Okay. So we have a pretty large input resistance, which for certain types of amplifiers, like um, op amps and things like that is a very good thing, but for certain other types of amplifiers might be a bad thing. So this kind of limits our choices as to what we can use this amplifier for, whether we have an application that needs a large input resistance or a small input resistance tells us whether or not we could use um, an emitter to generation scheme. So from our output resistance, let me make a copy of this circuit again. Um, and let's go to the next page. Come on, computer, work with me. All right, so once again, for our output impedance or output resistance, we have to short circuit our input voltage. And we are going to apply some test voltage here across our output terminals. The test and this quantity, which we'll need to find, will be I test. So things are, again, not quite as easy as we had in our previous case. So we're gonna prove something real quick here. If I apply Kirchhoff's voltage law on the left-hand side of the circuit, uh, I can say that the voltage drop VBE uh, plus the voltage drop over my resistor RE. So that's gonna be the current flowing from um, this direction, which is given by BBE over R pi, plus the current flowing from this direction, which is given by GM VBE is equal to zero. So from this, what can we say about the voltage VBE? At zero. Exactly right. Yeah, so effectively we have like x plus 3x plus 5x is equal to zero, which means x, or in this case VBE, has to be exactly equal to zero volts. And from that, we know that this current is zero amps. And so all of I test. is flowing down through resistor RC. None of it branches off and flows through that dependent source, which obviously means R out is just RC. Yeah, 
Now, if we had the early resistance in here, um, we're not going to go through the, the steps here, but I just want to talk about kind of why we're ignoring it and how much it complicates things, right? So our early resistance are not would be here. It's not directly in parallel with that resistor RC anymore. And so we have, well, I guess actually that wouldn't be that bad because it looks like it's just going to be R not in parallel with RE. Excuse me, um, RC in parallel with R not plus RE. But anyway, it's gonna it's gonna make some of our calculations a bit of a pain in the ass to do, which is why we're typically gonna leave it off for our more advanced analysis uh, amplifiers. So anyway, all right. Um, so we know our in uh, our small signal input resistance. We saw that uh, the presence of that emitter to generation resistor had a large impact on that value. Um, we see here from R out that it has no impact whatsoever on our small signal output resistance. Uh, so let's see what happens with our voltage gain. this guy right here because we don't need it. All right. So there are a couple of things that we can do here. All right, first, um, let's say that our small signal output voltage V out is going to be negative GM VBE times RC. Everybody okay with that? Nobody's saying that they're opposed to it, so I'm going to take that as you guys are in agreement. I'm going to rearrange this slightly because I'm going to need to use this in a minute and say that from this, we can see that VBE is V out divided by negative GM RC. So that's just simple algebraic manipulation there. Hopefully you guys are all on board. So if I do Kirchhoff's voltage law on the left-hand side of this circuit, what I find is I have Vn is equal to the quantity Vbe plus Re multiplied by VBE over R pi plus GM times VBE. So again, all I'm doing here is I'm just saying I have this voltage drop here, and then I'm adding the voltage drop across my resistor where it's going to have a contribute uh, my resistor RE, where there's going to be a contribution from uh, the current flowing through resistor R pi, and then a contribution of current coming from our dependent source on the right-hand side. Well, if I substitute in this relationship, what I wind up getting is Vn is equal to negative out divided by GM RC plus let's see how I do this real quick here. 
Um, so what I'm about to do is pull out an R pi here. Uh, but I need to pull it out from the whole thing, right? So if I pull out R pi, that's going to give me R e over R pi times V B e. No, oh, okay, sorry. I'm, I'm misinterpreting my own notes. My apologies. Um, RE over R pi times VBE. So that's going to be negative V out over GM RC. And then I have uh, an RE GM. I wasn't pulling anything out, I was just distributing the RE. My apologies for the confusion times VBE, so this is negative V out over GM RC as well. And I can pull out my common factor of V out. And this is gonna look like negative one over GM RC minus R E over G M R C R pi minus G M R E over G M R C or negative V out over GMRC times a factor of one plus one over R pi plus GM times RE. And from this voltage gain is negative GMRC divided by one plus RE multiplied by R pi plus GM like so. Um, Another way to express this is negative beta RC divided by R pi plus one plus beta RE where we're saying that one over R pi is GM over beta. So my personal preference is looking at this guy right here, okay? And the reason I say that I prefer that representation is because it looks the most similar to what we had before we did this emitter degeneration. Okay. So this term up here, negative GMRC, is our voltage gain before emitter degeneration. And then we have this new denominator. Okay, so the effects of having um, a 
degeneration resistor in our system influences the gain by lowering it, right? Because it's whatever value it had divided by one plus and then some uh, scaling factor times RE. So the emitter degeneration resistor lowers the magnitude of the voltage gain of the system. It increases the input impedance of the system and it has no effect whatsoever on the output resistance of the system, okay? So do any of you guys remember what the emitter to generation resistor was used for in our DC biasing networks? Okay, nobody saying much of anything. So that degeneration resistor was used to decrease the sensitivity of the bias network to changes in beta uh, due to you know slight differences in manufacturing tolerances and all that kind of good stuff, okay? So for the DC biasing circuit, the presence of a resistor RE uh, is actually a good thing. Uh, but on the amplifier side, generally speaking, we could would consider it to be a bad thing because it lowers the voltage gain of our system. So I want to go back to, actually, I don't know that I saved it. Never mind. Uh, on Friday or la last Friday, when we worked an example problem with the full bias network, there was a capacitor that was placed in parallel with the resistor RE. Well, the purpose of that capacitor is to keep the resistor RE in during the DC biasing portion of the circuit, but to effectively short it out or remove it in the AC circuit so that we get the best of both worlds. So anyway. Um, all right, so. The next thing that we're going to do is include some base resistance in our common emitter schemes. So we're gonna look at this guy. It's gonna be the exact same circuit that we just had with one subtle change. Sorry if you guys can hear random grunting, my dog is snoring next to me. So this is VN, okay? So the exact same circuit that we just analyzed, but now we have this additional base resistance. So without having to go through all of the huge details, um, what I want to do is call this voltage right here VB, okay? And what that's going to allow me to do is a couple of what I feel are interesting shortcuts. <laughs> uh, I might show you my dog in a little bit. Let's finish the lecture first. So 
when we're looking for our input resistance Rn, we're typically looking through the input terminals and trying to figure out what the resistance is. That's kind of by definition how we determine our input resistance, okay? But I would argue that if we looked in right here, I'm gonna call this guy Rn prime, we would see the exact same thing we saw in the last circuit. Right? So from this, we should easily be able to see that Rn is simply Rb plus our previous input resistance of, uh, dang it, R pi plus one plus beta Re. Does that make sense to everybody? Where, just to be clear here, this is our Rn prime under this case. Yeah, okay, fairly straightforward. What do you think the presence of the base resistor RB is going to have on our output impedance? Anybody have any thoughts? It's not gonna have any effect. Exactly right. Let me scroll up here and we can take a look at exactly why pretty easily here. So if I put, a resistor RB right here, that's just gonna add another term in this first equation where everything in terms of VBE was zero. So it's not gonna change that literally at all. So R out is exactly RC. For our voltage gain, we are going to do something similar um, to, to figure out what's going on without a whole hell of a lot of analysis here, okay? And so what I mean by that is we currently know what the ratio of V out to VBE is, or not VBE, uh, VB. She's making all kinds of noise right now, right? This is literally the results of our previous analysis where we would have negative GMRC divided by a factor of one plus RE times one over R pi plus GM. Everybody okay with that? Yes. Okay. So what I am suggesting here is that our voltage gain AV is, so by definition, we know that it's supposed to be V out divided by V in. Well, what I am saying is that it's going to be V out divided by VB multiplied by VB divided by VN. So effectively, we're breaking this amplifier up into effectively two stages to simplify the analysis. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. So how do we get that VB to VN relationship? Well, we know that from this point forward in the circuit, I'm gonna draw a little star around it here. From this point forward, we have a particular input resistance. So I would argue that from the perspective of our input voltage source, 
we have this resistance RB. Then we have this resistance Rn prime. And we are trying to find the relationship between the voltage drop at this node VB and uh, our input voltage Vn. Does that make sense to people? Let's let's start there. So we're just doing a voltage divider. Effectively, that's all that that base resistance does. Is it lowers the actual input voltage by some ratio that gets applied at the base terminal, and then that base terminal voltage um is the effectively the exact same thing as the input voltage in our previous example so that's that's a great way to put it we're effectively just by including some base resistance throwing some voltage divider with a particular transfer function into the mix right so from this guy we should easily be able to see that vb is just vn times sorry this should be rn prime Rn prime over Rb plus Rn prime. And from this, just make simple substitutions to find that our voltage gain for this system is. R pi plus one plus beta R e, which is just R n prime, divided by R b plus R pi plus one plus beta R e. So that's our R b plus R n prime. And so this whole thing represents VB over VN. And we multiply this by negative GMRC divided by one plus RE times one over R pi plus GM. Where this guy represents the quantity V out over VB. And the product of those two expressions is our voltage gain for our system. So what are the effects of this base resistance? Well, um, it increases the input impedance uh, of our system even further than the emitter degeneration scheme did because it's adding this lar typically large uh, value RB. Uh, it doesn't change our output impedance literally at all, um, but it, also serves to lower the voltage gain of the circuit in some way, shape, or form. Okay. So typically speaking, you don't want to lower the voltage gain, right? Uh, so we're seeing effectively what the trade-offs are here. Uh, we're about to look at our fully biased common emitter amplifier circuit and see what things that we can do to kind of eliminate or mitigate some of these uh, gain lowering factors um, we get with the inclusion of the resistances that are present in our DC biasing scheme. Okay. So our Sorry, my phone is ringing somewhere, but I'm not even sure where it's at. 
Um, so our common emitter amplifier with full biasing. And it's going to look something like this. And I think this is going to be the last thing that we're going to talk about today, which we're running out of time anyway, so that seems reasonable. Here is our resistor RC. We're going to have a degeneration resistor, RE. Instead of having a simple base resistance, that base resistance is actually going to be formed by this resistor, R1. And this resistor R2. So we have effectively our four resistor DC bias circuit here. We turn it into an amplifier by placing a coupling capacitor CC1 here at our input, where this is going to be some potential signal resistance. Um, so if our voltage source has some internal resistance, that's how we model it. Um, over here on this side, we're gonna have a coupling capacitor CC2. And then our load resistance RL. This is where we're gonna take our output voltage from. And, as I mentioned earlier, if we place the capacitor CE here, the whole purpose of these capacitors is that they look like open circuits at DC. And if we size them right, they'll look like short circuits at our frequency of interest where we're actually doing our small signal amplification. So if this capacitor CE is sized correctly such that it looks like a short circuit, it shorts out that resistor RE, eliminating the voltage gain reduction of the emitter degeneration amplifier scheme. Does that kind of make sense, at least logically in your heads to this point? Okay. So what I'm going to draw right now is what I'm going to call a simplified small signal circuit. So we're not going to actually go all the way through the steps of looking at the small signal model because we already know effectively how that bit behaves. So what I'm drawing here is just kind of a, a shorthand um, notation for how we're going to look at this circuit's constituent parts, okay? So with the understanding that our capacitors look like short circuits for our small signal model, we're assuming that we're operating at a frequency that will make that happen. And with the understanding that our DC power supply voltage, VCC, looks like an AC or small signal ground, this gnarly looking circuit looks like this as an amplifier. We have our signal resistance, our SIG. We're going to have a resistance R1 in parallel with R2 between our base terminal and ground. Then over here, we're going to have our BJT, where 
our resistor RE is shorted out. And over here, we take our output voltage. And because our capacitor CC2 looks like a short circuit, we're going to see between the output node and ground a resistance of RC, our DC biasing uh, collector resistance, in parallel with our load resistor RL. So is everybody okay with this representation? anybody has any questions, please, please ask. Okay, so why is it in parallel again? Okay, so why is RC in parallel with RL? So let's look up here, okay? So um, let me do this in the green, I guess, all right? So we're treating this node up here as AC ground. Are you okay with that, Luke? All right. We're treating this capacitor as a short circuit. So that means this node and this node are the same node. And between that node, which is our output node, we see RC connected to ground and RL connected to ground. So that means RC and RL behave as if they were in parallel for our small signal analysis. All righty, we're gonna be doing a lot of this. Okay. So how are we going to analyze this thing? Well, if I draw a dashed line, right here, and I'm gonna call this voltage VB. Everything to the right of the dashed line is just our common emitter core amplifier with two resistors in parallel at the output instead of just one. So this looks like our common emitter core with RC in parallel with RL. Everything to the left over here is just a voltage divider circuit. So we can say that the ratio of VB to VN is simply R1 in parallel with R2 divided by R sig plus R1 in parallel with R2. Everybody okay with that? And we're going to have V out over VB is just negative GM RC in parallel with RL. And if we wanted to include early effect, we could throw the resistor R0 in there as well. So from this, our voltage gain for this system is simply these two things multiplied by each other. 
R1 in parallel with R2 divided by R sig plus R1 in parallel with R2. All multi, uh, let's throw a negative sign out here. GM RC in parallel with RL. And if early effects are included in parallel with R0. So that's our voltage gain. What do you think our input resistance is going to be? This is our voltage gain calculation. We're kind of doing things in slightly different order, but it's not going to be that bad. V out over VB relationship. Okay. So I'm going to scroll up uh, real quick here. All right. Pretty much way back to the beginning of our lecture. If we look at this common emitter core amplifier and we were to draw that same kind of similar small signal um, approximation where VCC is treated as an AC ground, how is what we have right here any different than what we were just analyzing, except for the fact that there's a resistor RL in parallel with that resistor RC? Are, is this literally any different than what we were just looking at? So the RN is just R sig parallel to R1 parallel R2? Uh, we'll get to the input resistance in just a second, but I'm trying to explain this thing to, to Luke real quick. And then let, let me see what Annabelle's saying. So with the early effect, it just adds another resistor in parallel with the other two. So let me answer that question real quick as well. When we analyze this guy with the early effect, we found that our voltage gain was just negative GM times RC in parallel with R0 because that configuration where our emitter is at the ground terminal effectively places that resistor R0. Uh, so it's uh, occurring between the collector and the emitter or between the collector and ground. So that's why I was able to say, let me scroll down a couple of pages here. Uh, I think one more. That's why I was able to confidently say that I can just throw my early effect resistor R0 in parallel with RC, uh, because as long as this guy right here is grounded, that's exactly where it's going to show up. Now, Gregory, to, to answer your question, about what the input resistance is going to be. Everything to the, let's do it in blue. Everything to the left the right. of BB, right? I'm sorry, what was that? Everything to the left of BB. Well, so uh, we have this guy as well. Let's call this RM prime that we have to take care of. Oh, uh, okay, I see what you're doing. Right, so what we're going to see is R sig in series with the parallel combination of R1 in parallel with R2 in parallel with Rn prime, where Rn prime is just the input resistance of the common emitter core or R pi. So just to be clear here, uh, what I am saying is that we effectively have this situation. R sig 
in parallel with R1, or excuse me, R sig in series with uh, R1 in parallel with R2, or actually not even in series. And then over here, everything to the right of the dashed line this looks like R pi to the input resistance calculation. So when we're looking in here, what we see is R sig plus R1 in parallel with R2 in parallel with R pi. So just to explain where that's coming from again, if we focus just on this bit right here, okay? Just looking at this circuit, it's the exact same thing as this guy, except that RC is now in parallel with a resistor RL. So we would put that guy like this, which would in turn change that and that. Placing a resistor. RL doesn't change the input resistance of this common emitter core at all. And we saw that effectively when we included the early effect, right? With the inclusion of the early effect resistor, which is literally a resistor in parallel with the quantity RC, it didn't have any effect on the input resistance whatsoever. All right. Um, the last thing that we need to talk about for this guy, if I can find where I'm at, is R out. So what do you think R out is going to be? RC parallel R out? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely it. Because we saw earlier that putting some resistance uh, at the input of this thing shouldn't affect the output resistance literally whatsoever. So our output resistance, sorry, I keep scrolling slightly too far, for this configuration is just going to be RC in parallel with RL. And if early effects are included, R0 will be thrown in there as well. All right, uh, we are, we're out of time and we're finished up anyway. So um, I, I absolutely understand that a lot of what we are doing today might have seemed confusing. 100% understand why that is. What I'm going to have to ask you guys to do is to kind of spend some time after lectures and stuff like that, like literally looking at these circuits, because identifying these circuits is what makes this analysis easy and straightforward. If you're approaching it fresh without understanding, okay, so this bit looks like a common emitter core, this bit looks like a common emitter core with emitter degeneration or whatever, if you can't see those things, you're going to struggle for the remainder of this class and all through 336. Okay, so I 100% understand that the, the level of difficulty that you're seeing in this class is probably just ramped up rather significantly. Um, if you have a question about something, do not feel embarrassed to ask it because I guarantee you roughly half the class is at least partially lost at this exact moment. So asking questions, having me stop and say, okay, let's go back through the notes and see where this came from is perfectly, perfectly reasonable. I would much rather do that than move along and have a, a majority of you guys just totally lost and clueless, okay? 
So, um, all right. So with that being said, um, unless anybody has any questions, uh, we are finished up for this lecture. Uh, you have a good weekend as well. I will post this lecture um, tomorrow at the latest. Sounds good. Uh, the, um, what do you call it? Uh, take home portion. You know when that'll be up? Uh, th that will be up uh, this evening, I believe. I still have to figure out what I can do um, that isn't literally just your homework problem. So it's probably just kind of expect two more homework problems. All right. Sounds good. All right. You guys have a great weekend. Be safe in this not snowy winter weather event. <laughs>